story to tell. The Douglas A-20 Havoc is an American light bomber mainly used by the U.S. Army Air Force and Allied Powers Air Forces. The Douglas A-20 Havoc was designed in the late 1930s and short time for deployment at the beginning of the war. This was the second most produced aircraft of the U.S. during World War II, early after B-25 Mitchell. Havoc was probably the most supermodel bomber in the whole U.S. bomber chest, which was usually of a large ship. From a distance, Havoc has a look no different from some true engine fighters. In fact, Havoc has such a slender body that it is impossible to change positions between the crew. So in the position of the gunner, there is also the joystick to fly the plane in case the pilot gets hit. Over 7,800 units were built. It never gained the fame of the B-29 Mitchell. Havoc was very popular with American pilots due to its excellent flight performance and extremely easy to control. An inexperienced pilot can still fly Havoc easily as opposed to the Marauder. Despite using the Wingless engine, but thanks to his slim body and excellent aerodynamic design, Havoc was the fastest aircraft in the US main bomber with speeds up to 538 km per hour. This speed, along with the ability to fly well, helps Havoc get a chance to escape when encountering interceptor fighters, especially destroyers like the Mi-110 or J-1N Kiko, which is no faster than Havoc. Constructed as a light bomber, but more or less operated as a heavy fighter, the Havoc proved to be successful addition to the Douglas company line and the Allied war effort as a whole before eventually being replaced by the more capable Douglas A-26 Invader and not through B-61 Black Widow. The biggest disadvantage of Havoc is that the aircraft has the lowest bomb load in the US main bombers. The Havoc had the least number of crews during World War II, two to three people, only equivalent to a heavy fighter or knife fighter. The A-20 began life as a Douglas Model 7B, a light bomber powered by a pair of Pratt and Whitney R1830S3C3G twin wars engines with a capacity of 1,100 horsepower. Type 7B has good maneuverability and fast flight, but has not attracted orders in the US. Despite the failure, the aircraft attracted the attention of a French procurement committee visiting the United States and placed hundreds of Model 7Bs for immediate production in February 1940. Although not the fastest or longest range aircraft in its class, the Douglas TB-7 series distinguished itself as a tough, dependable combat aircraft with an excellent reputation for speed and maneuverability. When France collapsed under German power, some 95 French operated TB-7s escaped to North Africa where the rest of the US hands and contracted with them was transferred to British ownership. This aircraft was designated by the British as Boston. The Royal Air Force chose about 100 of these Boston light bombers and produced Havoc. Although originated as an American plane, Havoc was first controlled by No. 23 Squadron. There were several variants of the Havoc. The Boston one was powered by two Pratt and Whitney R1830 engines and was completely equipped to French specifications. Its high speed was its early asset and it was equipped with a knife fighter 
with eight 7.62mm caliber machine guns mounted in the nose. Havoc Jews were French DB-7As converted to knife fighters. A solid nose housed 7.62mm caliber machine guns. Own DB-7 versions were known to the British as the Boston. The British later converted their Bostons to radar-equipped knife fighters, and these were collectively known as Havoc. The United States Army Air Forces referred to the plane as the A-20 Havoc and the reconnaissance version as the F-3. The basic design of the A-20 was quite popular at the time with the deep cylindrical fuselage and caliber monoplane wing in the middle and the H wing containing a Raider 3 propeller engine. The empennage was traditional, equipped with a vertical stabilizer and horizontal cantilever planes. The undercarriage has three wheels, in which the two main wheels concave into each engine shell, and a single wheel in the rear of the cockpit floor. The engine cells on either wing assembly came to a point where past the wing trailing edge, giving the A-20 its distinct top-down silhouette. Overall, the aircraft has a suitable structure for its work, proving to be a success for Douglas. Like most larger aircraft during World War II, Havoc's airframe was specifically designed to withstand the damage and still keep her crew alive. The airframe also appears to be adapted to a variety of internal weapons and systems. Weapons were changed during the war. Standard weapons include a combination of four 12.7mm machine guns mounted in the nose of the aircraft, providing attack power. In the position of the back, also attached a pair of such machine guns. Internal bombs will be used to increase destruction efficiency, up to 1.8 tons of bomb load. Part of this load can be used for additional fuel. To increase the attack power on the nose, the weapon is increased to 6 12.7mm machine guns. A pair of 12.7mm machine guns in the rear cockpit and a single 12.7mm machine gun in the van position through a tunnel. Visibility for the Havoc was good from the cockpit and store characteristics were considered docile and it handled very well during low flying operations. Note that the A-20 was actually designed as a light bomber, but it was often used as a medium bomber. The cockpit was designed with glass canopy, providing great views forward, above and to the sides. Doors were mounted along the starboard side of the frame and allowed easy access to the seat. Flight control was done through a traditional control wheel, mounted on the flexible columns. Gun buttons, thruster control buttons, and propeller controls were reasonably arranged and easy to access. The dial and gauges were placed in a position with good visibility. The pilot can access the controls of the fuel tank, bomb selector, radio and cockpit heating right on his seat. Overall, the cockpit was highly appreciated by both American and British pilots. More than 3,600 Havocs were sent to Russia under Lendlis, which was almost twice that sent to the British, and substantially more than the 1,962 aircraft delivered to the United States Army Air Forces. The majority of the aircraft delivered to the Soviet were A-20s, but records indicate that 20 aircraft were TB-7Bs. Soviet airmen almost unanimously agreed that the Havocs met and oftentimes exceeded their requirements for a light twin-engine bomber. It was fast, maneuverable, and easy to fly. One Soviet airman, Pavel Mikhailovich Rokho, recalled, 
The advantage of the Boston was that it had a steering wheel in front and was much easier to control, and they were really fast. However, the highest praise given to the aircraft was its reliability and forgiving nature, especially when compared to the Soviet-built Pelyakov P-2 dive bomber. Its ability to fly on one engine was specially valued by all Allied pilots who flew Havels, not just Soviet airmen. After Japan's surrender, many of the Soviet Union's A-20s were decommissioned and scrapped, though not all. In the late 1940s, several Bostons were converted into VIP transports and utility aircraft, and the Northern Fleet continued using their Havocs as torpedo bombers until 1954. Despite the fact that the Havoc was used extensively by Soviet forces in the victory over Germany, the memory of Israel is, unfortunately, either tainted by Cold War rhetoric or forgotten altogether. The Douglas A-20 is oftentimes overlooked by aircraft enthusiasts from own countries, but from North Africa to the Mediterranean, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and the Pacific. The Havoc was the first capable and reliable aircraft that quietly and effectively served a number of fighter functions which ultimately helped the Allies achieve victory over the Axis. My video of H&T Havoc ends here. Thank you for watching. If you find this video interesting, please give me your thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to support the channel. Goodbye and see you again in the next videos. Oh,